coil update. I've gone through, I've redone the wiring on this. I've switched from stranded core to solid core instead. And I've got everything hardwired in now. This area here is where I do all my testing from. That's where everything hooks up to, primaries and secondaries. So, there's a shot of the coil. I've given up on using the the reed switches uh, as the trigger for this thing. They seem to get too much voltage drop across them. So I'm using a mechanical 20 amp automotive relay now. I've installed a terminal block for each individual winding. I'll just explain to you how I've got this thing wired up. So right here, terminal block, this is coil number one. And this wire here is the beginning of the copper wire that goes in on this side of the coil, on the left side of the coil. Next one over, the black wire, that's the beginning of the cable on the left side of the coil. Third wire over, the red wire, that's the end of the coil number one coming out on the right side of the coil. And the same thing with the black wire here, that's the end of the cable coming out. So each one has its own individual terminal block. So what I've done is, as you can see here, I've got these jumpers in. So I've joined the beginning of coil number two with the end of coil number one. So that's the copper. Same thing for the black. The beginning of the cable on coil number two joins to the end of coil number one. And the goes down the entire line for all 12 coils. I've got this red wire right here. Obviously that's the input on coil number one. So what I've got is that hooks up to my terminal block. And that's this wire right here. The next wire beside it is the end of coil number 12 sitting right here. So each coil is, uh, the cable's tied together in, in a series circuit and so is the copper wire. So that comes over and I've got the end of the coil right there. So these are the two wires right now that I'm using as my trigger to turn the coil on and off. These other two ends that we have right here are the other ends of the coil. I've wound the secondaries so that there are two coils and what I've got is, is I've got a small jumper across here. So this is uh, joining both secondary windings together. So I'm using this lead right here and this lead right here to measure the voltage and the waveform coming off the secondary coil. So how I got the water in. You can see that little red tube sticking right there. When I built these end plates, individual hole for each cell, I just stuck those tubes in there. And I used a gravity feed system on it. So what I did was just a bottle of water, some silicone tubing, and a couple of clamps on it. I just hooked those up to the cells, let the clamp go, and let each individual cell gravity feed and fill itself. Naturally, I put too much water in some of the cells. Those are the cells that are down on voltage a little bit. So I had to figure a way of trying to get some water out. So I just got some uh, synthetic chamois material, cut it on a little point, and I just use a screwdriver. And all I do is I just stick it in the hole, make sure that end touches the cotton, and it seems to wick the water out of there pretty good. When it came to the water, I did not use tap water. I had eight liters of distilled water that I added a half a cup of salt to for all eight liters. I wanted a bit of an electrolyte in the battery. As legend has it, Nathan Stubblefield buried his batteries under oak trees. And some of the oak trees in Murray, Conduct Murray Kentucky um, need very acidic soil. So naturally, he was using the moisture in the soil and the acidity to act, uh, to act as the electrolyte in his battery. That's why I put a little bit of salt in there. I don't know if that was a, a right decision or not. But I did it anyways. Now, when it comes to the open circuit voltage of this thing, it's all over the map. And it seems to change from day to day. I just have a small rag on here right now to cover up the noise of that relay. That's all that's in there. 
So when each individual cell is disconnected, I'm getting anywhere from uh, 200 millivolts up to 400 millivolts. And it seems to change a little bit on a day-to-day -day basis. When I tie all the cells together, I get about 0.3 of a volt out of it when I'm measuring it at those two contacts right there. Milliamps per cell, again, is all over the map. I've had um, cell number one, 24 milliamps, hardly anything. Cell 12, I've had up to 252 coming out of it. I can see that because it has more wire in there. But some of these lower cells, two, three, and four, these have been up around 150, 200 milliamps for a short time, then it seems to disappear.